Welcome back to another video tutorial on using PixInsight. In this one we're going to look at narrowband processing and to begin with narrowband processing with color sensors. Now in the past the traditional way of doing narrowband imaging was to take a monochrome camera typically a CCD and put narrowband filters in front of the entire sensor and basically take three monochrome images one for oxygen, one for hydrogen and one for sulphur and you would get an image at the end of it something like this where the individual filters even though there are two shades of red and a turquoise green are mapped to the red green and blue channels and combined to create a false color image and there's no reality here this this hence the word false color and you can get something that's green like this or you can get something where the colors have been altered by blending the monochrome channels into the red green blue channels to create any color palette that you really like or to emphasize a particular structure so that's all very well and good but a lot of people are using color sensors at the moment typically the CMOS ones and to start with let's look at how we would do narrowband imaging with one of those now if you simply take a color CMOS camera and stick it and point it at the sky after removing light pollution you might get something like this. In fact this is quite good because I've used a deep red filter on the front of the camera that has emphasized the red nebulosity and removed some of the light pollution. But it's not as entertaining as the one taken with a monochrome camera. That is simply processing a color image but just emphasizing the nebulosity by a, a large degree of stretch. I think it's more interesting to take a look at this one. So this was done in a similar way except the way it's been processed is entirely different. So here we have a color CMOS camera with a red green blue Bayer array and it is fitted with a duo narrowband filter. Now this filter has two pass bands one in the turquoise blue where the oxygen emissions are and one in the deep red where the hydrogen emissions are. It doesn't really cover sulfur it's really mostly hydrogen but turquoise is in between green and blue so the light passing through the filter will excite pixels on the sensor that are filtered by green and blue bare array filters and the hydrogen will go through the red this is quite an efficient way of doing it because you're in effect getting two narrow bands at the same time with the same filter with the same exposure and to get the color differential between the cores of these galaxies and the outside we process these in a subtly different way. So the first thing we do is we're going to separate the color image into its constituent parts. So if I just get rid of that for a second and bring up the actual original color image. So this is its unstretched state and if I was to apply a normal stretch with um, setting the limits so that it's white balanced at one end and black balanced at the other you get a very dim version of the nebula but it's predominantly red because the hydrogen alpha emissions are that much stronger than the oxygen ones. What we'll do is change this into three separate monochrome files corresponding to red green and blue channels in the RGB image and to do that we use this little button here which has got split RGB channels or you can use the channel extraction tool which again creates separate red green and blue channels. Once you execute this you will find it generates three files with a red, blue and green suffix at the end. Nothing to write home about just mostly black with a few white dots. Now the trick here is to remove the stars equalize the intensities between the nebulas and then recombine them back into a color image and because it's a color image we don't necessarily need high degrees of detail what we really want them to be as smooth as possible and the reason that we emphasize this smoothness is that while the hydrogen channel is quite strong typically the O3 and also sulfur 2 if you're using it the strength of the signal from the, from the nebula is much weaker and therefore it becomes a lot noisier. Now what I've done is pre-process these so that you can see the steps in quick order. So the first step to do 
would be to give something for the star reduction to get his hands on. First of all, a little bit of trimming um, on the black point and then a master stretch just to show the stars and the nebula. Then run the star net module that removes the stars and gives you something to work with. A little bit of noise reduction and then equalize the background and then a little bit of stretching and then a little bit more noise reduction and just some final tweaks to get the intensities right. The important thing with the intensities is that we don't want anything approaching white in this image because as soon as you get to white you clip the, the channel. What we want is something that's quite clear and distinct but mostly in mid-tones which gives us the best colour information to work with. And then finally there's a little bit of convolution which is in effect blurring and that gives you a final red hydrant alpha image. And we do exactly the same process of taking the stars out after a little bit of stretching and we're going to get to an end point where we have, just get to this one here, so remove the stars, stretch it and we get to a much weaker nebulosity. And one trick we can apply to get the colour balances more or less right is rather than just simply accept this nebulosity as it stands here, is to actually take the range that we've got here and use something called the linear fit and take the red and apply it to the other channel. And when we do that, what it will do is it will give an intensity range in this channel which is similar to the other one. Now, as you see, that's created a little bit of clipping, which isn't too great. And also you can see that the background is far more mottled than before. So in this particular case, it's probably a bit overkill and it's better to manually adjust the image so that it has a, an intensity range that is compatible with this one. So they look, they look similar, but not the same. But you can see here, that if I put the cursor on here, it's clipping to the white channel. So that's, that's not going to work. So undo that and probably something like a histogram transformation stretch will be sufficient. So once we've got our three channels, we can then combine them back again to form a color image. So we would take our three stacks, red, green, and blue that we've formed. These are all starless images and they've been stretched so that there's a, a reasonable color balance. And when we execute that, we will be produced a new image, which will just be given a simple numerical reference. It's hiding under here. It's got the wonderful title of image 18. And we have now a color image back again, predominantly red because of the hydrogen alpha. And you can see there's some turquoise regions in the middle where the oxygen was strongest. Now, there's a couple of things we need to do to this image to get it to be the most colorful and noise-free image that we can make. So the first thing to do is slightly soften it and again, equalize the background to get it as neutral as possible. Because we've combined three separate monochrome channels, they don't necessarily have exactly the same background levels. Give it a sensible name and a little bit of blurring. If there's any green pixels in there that look objectionable, take those out with selective color noise reduction. A little bit more blurring. And the final step will be to combine it with the luminance. Now we haven't discussed luminance yet, so we need to put a pause on that and shrink that down. So to generate the luminance file, we do something similar but different. So we take our original image and this time, instead of hitting this button here, we do this one here. And that extracts the luminance component from the RGB image. And that will produce a separate file with an L suffix. And here it is. So nothing particularly to write home about. You can see some faint nebulosity and the stars. So when we process this one, we're looking for detail. We're trying to not clip again and we are going to do the stars slightly separately. So in this case, what we're going to do is remove the stars and then we're going to stretch it. 
and there's a number of ways of doing the stretch but basically I'm using a combination of mask stretch, local histogram transformation which is this one here which operates at larger scales than the normal sharpening tools that typically operate up to about a diameter of 64 pixels. I'm trying to change the contrast based on a scale of about 300 pixels and I do that for a number of different scales just to boost the faint nebulosity areas. If you use um, this tool, the local histogram transformation tool, at the same time as having bright stars in there, it sometimes creates a slightly dark halo, wide, big dark halo around a star. So another reason to remove the stars. And moving on, I then start to do some sharpening, a little bit more um, boosting of local contrast, uh, a little bit of noise reduction in the base shadows, just to get it right. And once I've got it right, I'm going to clean up some of these little markings around the outside edge where the stars were. And they will go around here. So if you just look back there, these little faint echoes of where the brighter stars were have just disappeared using clone stamp. And that gives a bit of a cleaner image. And then again, a little bit more boosting of the intensities and again, a little bit of noise reduction. So this is now my luminance file, which I can now combine with my color file. So if I get back to here and bring up my color negative file, and I need to bring up process I always forget which one it is, LRGB combination. So bring up this file here and drag it onto here. Hopefully we will get a file that's similar to the final one. It's not quite there. We've got the detail that we want. So if I zoom in, you can see the detail in the shadows, um, in these little globules and such. But what we haven't done is fine tune it. So typically what would happen now is you'll fine tune the color balance and so forth just to get that image just right to form the final image. But there's something missing in this image and that is all the little stars. What we do here is we need to process the image another time to find the stars. So we now need to create an image that has colorful stars that are the right intensity and the right color. And to do that I will pick my original image and duplicate it and process it. And the processed image I'm going to call star stack and it's on here when I can find it. So without the screen stretch all you can see is a few tiny white dots. If I do a normal screen stretch you can see that the red light pollution takes over whereas this one has an adjusted screen stretch for each of the channels. So let's move that out of the way and let's go through the processing sequence. There's a number of ways of doing this. I can either hover the mouse over here as I've been doing earlier, or I can bring up the History Explorer and bring up Star Stack from the list. And you can see that, first of all, um, I do dynamic background extraction, which basically gets the image with a, a better background. And then I'm going to color calibrate with two previews, one over an area of dark sky and one with an area of bright stars. And once I've done that, I can then start stretching it. So I do a combination of mask stretch, curves and histogram transformation to get to an image which has got the right intensity levels. And by the time I get to the right intensity levels, I've now got stars that show up in the image. They're not super bright. Um, in fact, if you look up close, you can see that the cores are not clipping yet, which is good. And what we need to do is do a couple of other little things to make them just right. One is to blur them very slightly, which also reduces the peak intensity in the middle, and a little bit more tweaking on levels, and we're done. So this is our star image. And that star image, I now need to combine with this image below to create my final image. And to do that, I'm going to use a star mask. Now, there's a number of ways of doing the star mask. 
one of the neatest ways is actually to use the StarNet module again, but this time rather than removing stars, it removes the nebulosity. And when it does that, it comes up with a mask like this, which is highly detailed, as you can see. Now, what you can do is apply this mask to the color image at the bottom here, and then dump the stars on top. This mask is probably a little bit too precise. It'll give it a slightly unnatural look. The stars are quite hard edged. So I can create a duplicate of this and start playing around with some different versions. And in the end, I came up with this one, which is just slightly different in so much that the stars are not quite as maddening as and, and intrusive as the other one. And they've just got some slightly softer edges with a little tiny bit of, of convolution. And that image is a better one to use as a mask. So I can now drag that mask onto here and apply it. And now bring up the Pixel Max tool, which strikes fear into everybody, with the simplest expression possible. It simply has the name of the star stack image in the, in the expression. And typically, if there was no mask in place, it would completely replace this image with that one. Just to prove it, if I just simply disable the mask for a second and drag that to here, it'll make it the same as the image. So let's undo that, re-enable the mask and reapply it. And now it'll just simply put in this image where the mask allows it, which is the stars. So now we have small stars that are not overpowering the image and allow the nebulosity to be the main event and support it. And we can still fiddle with this. We can increase the saturation and, and alter the balance. But what I've tried to do is not remove the faint nebulosity in the margins and equally try to keep the star color realistic without too many in the um, way of little halos around them. So you can see that even zoomed up close, the stars haven't got halos, which is rather nice. So they look natural and the nebulosity is not too bad. Although as expected, because this was a fairly short exposure, there's a little bit more noise in the green and the blue areas than in the red. There you have it. The key essential steps along the path is to create a color image that is saturated, that is smooth without noise, you'd put all the detail and all the sharpening and all the, um, and the selective noise reduction in your luminance file and in this case a luminance file without stars to create a nice nebulosity image and then take your stars and then apply them afterwards and the reason that we're doing the stars separately because i've had a couple of questions on this is simply because the amount of stretching you would need to do on a nebula to get the nebula to be as pronounced as we see on the screen now would make the stars look horrendous. They'd just be huge white blobs. And so processing the stars separately allows us to control it and have it just the way we want it. So in the next video, we're going to take a look at doing proper false color narrowband imaging, which this really isn't because this is, the color hasn't shifted at all. All we've done is slightly pronounced some colors more than others, but the colors are true to themselves. But in the next um, video, which will take a few days to put together, we're going to look at false color narrowband imaging, which is perhaps the most inventive and innovative. Thanks for watching.